Father, we thank you once again. We thank you for your awesome, awesome blessing upon our lives. We know that you are always on your throne and nothing can change that. We know that you are all knowing, all seeing, ever present. But the scripture says, where can I go to hide from the Lord? Not in heaven, not on earth, not even in hell. The eyes of the Lord is all over. And we thank you for that. We are blessed because you have called us your children. Today we stand to receive from you and we pray even as your word comfort will accomplish that which you ordained for it to accomplish in our hearts and in our lives. That you may bring the transformation that is necessary for us as the people of God. Bless us, O oh Father. Holy Spirit, we yield to you. Speak to us and speak to us. Let us be better than we came in when we live from here today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you, church. Amen. 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 How many of us um, can I know that the Lord is watching us right now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, literally looking at us right now. Yes. <laughs> Once in a while, I allow myself to think in that direction. Some, sometimes it might be mind-boggling for us. We don't think that way because, um, you know, we are busy thinking about this. I also because of the way we see things. We don't know all things. We, we're not everywhere at all times. Even though Google might want to say back to Difa, you know, how you can just about Google anything these days. But even Google cannot come close to the Lord. Amen? Amen. When it comes to being present, being uh, aware, so I want us to always have that in mind as we go through life. This is why when we allow ourselves to do meditation, some Christians think the word meditation is a bad thing. But the Bible says meditate in the word of God. Amen? Amen. Meditate means dwelling on something, allowing that thing to flow through you. Sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Just allowing that thing to overwhelm you. To allow yourself to think beyond what you know of that thing. To open your heart up that there could be more than I know about this thing. There's always something that needs to be learned. One of the saddest things for believers is to think that, you know, I already know the book of Matthew. I've studied it. I'm done with it. I'm an expert. There is no such thing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord will continue to reveal to us as much as we are hungry to see. When we shut the door, one thing the Lord does not do is break the door. He knocks. In the book of Revelation, it says, I stand and knock if somebody opens. If anyone opens, I will come here and then I will dine with him. And the enemy is the one that tries to break the door. He can come with fear. He could come with teasing. He could come with pleasing. He could do up just to break the door. And once you open the door, mm, he puts his foot. It's hard to close it. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that let us never get to the place where we... When we start reading the scripture, I already know that part, just keep it, go to the next one. The Lord may be trying to open that scripture once again to us. Then it is that long ago, I had this revelation as I was reading the scripture, all of a sudden, it felt, the page that I was on felt like a, a high-rise building, like the walls lifted up and just like levels. In other words, it felt like uh, uh, 
floors of a building. Does that make sense? You know, like if you look at a 40-story building, there are floors. The revelation to me was that each floor has something that, a revelation that the, the other floor didn't have, that you need to find, you need to find as you go, you still finding things from the same foundation. So let us open our hearts to the Lord. Amen. 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 I will say, Johnny, that is just a very personal and private journey that every one of us should be willing to be on. Today we continue with our message from the book of Daniel. We are in chapter 8 now. Daniel chapter 8. Last time or the previously I said that Daniel uh, we saw, when we think about somebody who interpreted dreams, we always think about Joseph. But the book of Daniel was actually a book of dreams and visions, praise the Lord. There are so many dreams and visions that uh, the good thing about it, or the awesome thing about it, some of them we actually get that quick, right away interpretation for us. And when you go to the book of Daniel, this is another reason why when you have a very troubling dream, don't always take it one for word for word. Because when you look at the book of Daniel, he saw things that when it was now interpreted, was totally different from what he was looking at. But the idea kind of falls in line. So, yeah, let us... Uh, be careful how we interpret dreams. But all we know is that when serious dream comes to us, when the Lord gives us a dream, it's for a reason. Amen? Yeah. It's for a reason. So we should not just throw it aside. So today we continue with the book of Daniel. And in this chapter 8, we give it the title, The King with the Fierce Features. The king with the fierce features. Last time we talked about the ancient of days and what happened in that one. Now we're talking about the king with the fierce vision. And we're going to see from this vision of Daniel that we should not take end time for granted. Praise the Lord. When you hear about end time, end time, end time, the Lord is coming soon and those kind of things. Do not take them for granted. Sorry, and that is on, right? Yes. Thank you. I don't know why I'm thinking about it. <laughs> we should never take it for granted for the reasons we shall see soon. And that also, it will allow us to also remember that scripture that says, what will it profit a man that he gains the whole world and loses his soul? When Jesus Christ came to earth, he talked a lot about end times. In fact, for that reason, that is a major part of why he came, end times. Sadly, today we've transformed it, or changed it to mean that the major part will be how you feel right now. If you will allow yourself to listen to the first uh, disciples, when I say first disciples, I'm talking about the ones who wrote to us. When I said, listen, when you are reading the scripture, don't just read the word alone. Try to read the attitude in the world, praise the Lord. Try to read the environment in the world. The world. Try to read the spirit in the world. You have to know the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth. Amen? It's, a, it's not a black and white thing. It's a dimension thing, the Word of God. This is why um, sometimes uh, I wish we didn't have too many pictures. Or even written things so that we can let our imagination, our spirit come alive. What am I saying? What I'm, what I'm saying is, allow yourself to let the word speak to you. Amen? Amen. Not just memorize the scripture. You can memorize King James, 
NIV sounds different. New Living Translation sounds different. Because your speaking in change doesn't mean that you're a more of a Bible person than an NIV person. Do you get what I'm trying to, where I'm going with that? In fact, you do yourself more good when you're able to speak the scripture you read in your own words, your own understanding. That means you actually understand what you just read. Just, you know, throwing out the same thing you just read may not, you know, just memorizing something and dropping it down. Quickly before I start, let me give you this story since it came to me now. In middle school, praise the Lord, we, did, we started literature in middle school. We call it, they, they call it what here? English, right? English, but back home we call it literature. Where we have to read a particular book and, you know, uh, explain it and do all that stuff, comprehension and all that. So it was this small book they gave to us, I can't remember the name, but a friend of mine and I, we, we formed the habit of, we wanted to know this book from the beginning to the end, but it wasn't a big book, it was a story, it's a good novel, a story. So we decided that the best way to make sure that we don't miss anything from this book is to memorize it. So my friend and I, we memorized the book when he takes the book and I will be start from chapter one and I'll start up. He will be looking at the book and I'll be, you know, reciting the book. If I miss any so oh, no, you mean you skip one back. We look at it, okay, no right, then you so memorize the stuff. He memorized it. It came to exam time. The questions were so easy because we, we memorize the stuff. Then one question. I don't know what got into the teacher. He decided to use a word that was not in the book as part of the question. When I read that question, it didn't make sense to me because my, in my head I was scanning through the book, pages, pages, and I couldn't find that, that, that part of the book. I started sweating. I started trying to figure out how, what is this thing talking about, and I couldn't, I didn't answer that question. Why? Because he changed the world. But it's the same question. If I had really studied and understood the book, it would be so easy to answer. It was a very simple. When he explains later, when we saw the answer to the question, I was so angry with myself because I knew this page. I could see it in my, my brain where it is in the page. But because he changed the world, I was lost. What was that telling me? I didn't know that book, I just memorized it. It happens to a lot of uh, believers today. We memorize the word, but we don't even understand what the word is saying. From that day, of course, I realized that, hey, vomiting words doesn't mean you understand it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, as we start, Quickly, we're going to look at chapter 8 of Daniel. We actually read uh, a major part of it today, from verses 1 to 14. And again, this is a, another dream of Daniel. And Daniel himself actually dreamt this. Oh, no wonder my thumb is not working. I didn't plug it in. One second. So Daniel had a dream that this is not just uh, because he ate something in the night before and it was bothering his stomach. It was because the Lord wanted to say something to him. Amen. And the Lord wanted to use that to also speak to us today. So he started by saying that he was in the third reign of Belshazzar. Belshazzar. If you remember Belshazzar, praise the Lord. He was the, the king, the stupid king who was trying to use God's um, uh, holy things to throw party. Remember when he was throwing party? He went and took all the, the, all the utensils that were taken from Israel, Jerusalem, the, the temple in Jerusalem. His father took from the temple of Jerusalem, the Nebuchadnezzar. And the father died and handed over the kingdom to him. He decided to throw a party, and he was told them to go bring it himself and his family are going to use that to do their, you know, all their nonsense. Remember how he saw a hand writing on the wall and 
he dies that night. Anyhow, that was the same with Belshazzar. Three, day, three years into his reign, Daniel got this dream. And this dream was so uh, 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 troublesome to Daniel that he needed some help with it. First, he said he was at the river Ulai, or Ulai, however you say, and uh, he saw a ram with two horns by this river. The ram came up. We're going to talk, we read it, so we're just going to summarize. The ram came up, and he said that this ram was, you know, just a, an awesome looking animal. If things we pay attention here, he said that this ram began to, you know, push, began to push to westward, northward, and southward. I mean, keep that in mind. Westward, northward, and southward. That would mean that it was from the east, right? It was pushing the other way. Okay, so he said as he was doing that, he was growing mightily and doing his thing. And eventually, he was going all of a sudden, a male goat, a male goat rose from the west. The male goat rose from the west and began to do what? He said the male goat flew on a ran. What I mean by flew or ran, he says that he's, he's, he didn't touch the ground and he just jumped. His target was the ram. This male goat had one horn between his eyes. So his purpose was to come against that ram and he came against the ram and attacked the ram. And he defeated the ram. And the Bible says eventually the goat's horn broke and the new horns came out of the goat. Four horns came out of the goat. Is this kind of spooky yet? Still going, right? Four horns came out of the goat and eventually these four horns grew. They were just growing, growing. The Bible said they grew to the four winds of heaven. Four winds of heaven. When the Bible talks about the four winds of heaven, basically talking about reaching all areas. For some reason, the Bible describes as earth and heaven with four uh, number, dimension, and stuff like that, or foundation, or regions, four winds of heaven. So I'm just using this now, but we're going to see the interpretation. Praise the Lord. Just the key points. So he said later, the little horn, when the four wings were growing, then one horn came out, one tiny little horn came out of one of the four horns, and this horn now superseded the rest of them. Right? When he superseded them, he grew exceedingly, as the scripture would say, say he grew, this horn grew exceedingly great, and this horn started growing towards the south, towards the east, and towards the north. Remember the first one came from the east and spread to the rest of the world. This one now is from the west and spread to the rest of the world. He said the horn attacked the host of heaven. This small horn that became mighty attacked everything. He attacked everything and he exalted himself as the prince of the hosts. In other words, he set himself as, as the, the man or the thing. He said he stopped the daily sacrifice to the prince of hosts. Think about that. And he did all these things and prospered. He did all these things and he prospered. Now, the Lord gave uh, Daniel this dream, and like I said, on this vision, but the good thing is that he also gave the interpretation, amen? amen? So we are going to see the interpretation of this, but before we do that, one thing we know is that this is about the end time. The scripture told us it's about the end time. And we are going to see that even our Lord Jesus in the New Testament talked about the end time a lot. In fact, 
most of his ministry is about the end time. This is why he keeps saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. John said those things. Then Jesus keeps talking about, oh, you know, do not look at what you have now. Look at what you're going to get for eternity. Don't worry about your situation now. Keep your eye on the Lord. Praise the Lord. Keep your eye on heaven, on eternity. Keep your eye on, eye on salvation. What will it profit you now? If you lose, gain everything now, you lose your soul. It's all about eternity. Jesus spoke about eternity. We're going to see how the book of Daniel chapter 8 is in line with what the Lord talked about in one of his uh, 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 teachings. And that's what I want us to look at today. First, I want us to see that Matthew 24, 9 to 14. Let's just go into it. Matthew 24, 9 to 14. This is our Lord talking about end time. And we're going to come back and see the interpretation of the book of Daniel, chapter 8. Matthew uh, 24, 9 to 14. He said, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. That's our Lord Jesus talking about what will happen even to who? To Christians, to believers, right? To true believers. What will happen to true believers? Because some people, again, some people think when they become Christians, no bad thing will ever happen to them again. I don't know where they get that from. It's not from the scriptures. Matthew 24, 9 to 14. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise up and will arise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endured to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This is about the end times. Amen. Amen. He says there will be persecution, persecution even upon Christians. Persecution will come even to Christians. We can't say we are being persecuted now in America. It's not this time. Whatever you think you're going through right now, it's nothing compared to what the Lord, the picture he was trying to paint here. He says, false prophet, when he begins, he says, Christians will begin to betray Christians. Maybe to save themselves, they'll begin to betray Christians. And Christians will start hiding, others will begin to betray them. And, they, and we are all on the internet. Me, for me, my own will be over because they just go to the internet and get me and link me to all the messages I put on the internet, and I'm done. You know. But even the people that are hiding, if you're not on the internet, maybe you're not on Facebook, you're not on WhatsApp, you're not on blah blah blah. Somebody that knows, I know that dude. I know that baby. I used to see him with the Bible. So there will be no hiding place for believers. Praise the Lord. He said, false prophets will arise and begin to teach false things. They will begin to teach things that the Lord, the world will appreciate, Lord, the world will want. And those people who call themselves Christians who are trying to save themselves will begin to follow them just to hide under them. Say they will try to change Christianity and please the ruling authorities. Christianity will no longer be the same thing that our Lord brought to the earth. They will create their own form of godliness, but not true Christianity. This is the future that is coming. And all these things will happen before the end comes. And the Bible says, those who endure till the end, in other words, those who stand their ground, not like Florida, praise the Lord. Stand your ground in Florida is something different. Those who enjoy to the end, the Bible says, they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Enjoying to the end might mean losing one's life on earth. Because the Bible talks about those 
under the throne in heaven, Revelation. If you remember the book of Revelation, see they are there screaming and asking, when are their souls going to be, uh, um, you know, when is the Lord going to come against the people who came against them on earth? And told them to wait, the time is coming. So here, what are we looking at? We are seeing the Lord talking about the end times. So the question is, when is this end time? When will this end time be so that we can all be ready? So we can all prepare. That's what everybody would like to know. Even when we read the book of Daniel, I remember as a young, a young Christian, when I came in contact with the book of Daniel, and I saw the days where it says seven weeks was up, I started thinking about what does that mean? So I went to the scriptures and I said, oh, a thousand years, like one day, one day is like a thousand years. So I decided to calculate seven weeks, mathematics, right? How we try to calculate everything. Seven weeks, I convert it to days, and then convert it to a thousand years, to one year. So I came up with this number. And I was going, and my mind was working well, thinking, yeah, maybe I can. I finally figure this. I'm, I was trying to pinpoint the exact date and put it, compare, it, push it back to when Daniel was, and try to calculate. But the Bible is a very um, humbling place to be. Amen. When. When will this be? Many people have been trying to tell us when it will happen. Let us look at Matthew 24, 32 through 36. Aren't you glad you're going to know exactly the day now and the hour? Not Matthew 24, 32 to 36. It says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. We are about to find the day and the hour this will happen. When it is when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. I should have said to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my world will by no means pass away. No one knows the day and the hour. Oh, no. I was just being getting ready to begin to prepare. I was just this close. And look at what the Lord just did to me now. He said, no one knows the day or the hour, but that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Praise the Lord. So all your calculation, all your interpretation, all your revelation of the prophetic word of God about the end time, you, if you stand one day and tell me you know the day and the hour, I will say the devil is talking through you. I don't care who you are. All we can know is the season of trouble and tribulations are coming. Books have been written. In fact, some denominations, they are there and hour has passed more than one time. And guess what? <clears throat> the members of the denomination did not leave. Because there is more to denomination than just the word of God. There is some kind of bonding people make. The word of God becomes secondary to the bonding of the denomination. We all have to be careful in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. The scripture here clearly tells us our Lord Jesus himself. He says that no one knows the day or the hour. We know it is closer. One thing that we know is this. It is closer today than it was yesterday. Praise the Lord. That is all we need to know. All we need to know is it will happen suddenly. It will happen suddenly. You say, but there are many things that are supposed to happen. The Bible says prophetically that things are supposed to happen, and some of these things might take a long time. Haven't you been on earth? You've seen how some great men woke up one day, he was getting ready to go to work. By the end of the day, he's now a nobody. Something comes up, and will be thrown out of his office, and some of them will even end up in prison for the rest of their life. 
Ask me a week before. That will never happen. Everybody was afraid of them. So if man can do that on the worldly arena, how much more God? He can speed up things. He can make things slow. Praise the Lord. Things that we expect to happen for a hundred years can happen in one hour. And when you finish, we will all look and say, and we understand that it happened. So let us not be bogged down about the exact time. That is not our focus. Our focus should be, are we going to be ready when it happens, when the end time comes? Is our job going to prevent us to prepare? Is counting our money going to prevent us to prepare? What is it that will prepare to prevent us? We should never put that thing ahead of Christ. Amen? Amen. We should never put anything ahead of our Lord and our God. The relationship that we ought to have with Him. I want us to go back to the book of Daniel. The Lord has shown us that there will be an end time. So when we see the interpretation of the book of Daniel, we know that that interpretation will be real because the Lord himself spoke about the end time. So Daniel was not just having a bad dream. Daniel chapter 8, verse 17. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 8, verse 17. Daniel 8, verse 17. He says, so he came near where I stood. Now they are about to give him interpretation here. The angel Gabriel, in verse, uh, I think verse 16, angel Gabriel was told to go and reveal to Daniel what he just saw in his vision. So angel Gabriel is going to go and interpret this dream to Daniel. So verse 17 says, So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, and I fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for I did time of the end shall be the vision. In other words, this vision is not for now, it's for the end time. Amen? What you're looking at, Daniel, is something that will happen in the future. So you need to pay attention as we reveal it to you. Verse 18, we're going to use scripture to, so that it will be very clear to us. Verse 18 of Daniel chapter 8 says, verse 19, excuse me. He says, and he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, he's saying to Daniel, the angel Gabriel saying to Daniel, I'm here to tell you what will happen as the world starts coming to the end time. What we're going to find out here is, unlike the fear that people have, man is not going to end the world. I don't believe that man is capable of blowing up this world with nuclear weapons. If God decides that he wasn't ready, if you try to shoot down nuclear weapons, it will not blow up as you expect it to. And we're going to see from the Bible, so Christians should not be afraid of them. If they might destroy a region, but they can't blow up the world. Because the scripture never told us they can do that. God himself will decide when the end time will be. That's what the scripture says. Matthew Daniel 8, 20 to 21. Daniel 8, 20 to 21 says, the ram, remember the ram we talked about? The first one, the ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. What is that? Daniel was living in a time when the kings of Media and Persia were the authority on earth. Remember the book of Nets of Babylon? Then you, you see Darius, you see Belshazzar. They were actually ruling then. Europe, all the other places had no power in those days. The power of Africa or Egypt was dwindling, started to dwindle. So this is the time of Persia and Media. Uh, they were now the, the main kingdoms. So it says us that 
the fund, the, the, the uh, ram with the two funds were the Persian and Median kingdom and their kings. They are the ones that were reigning at that time. Now it also says that now the goods, the male goods, is Greece. When you hear Greece, think about what? Western Europe. Western Europe includes what? Americas. Praise the Lord. Because we are on the west side of things. Is it getting interesting slowly? Praise the Lord. This is it's a different type of service today. Praise the Lord. So the message is a little different. So I want you to pay attention. So now it tells him that after the media, media and Persia rule, the Greeks will take over. Even in our own day, when we look back, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, Temple Mount in Israel today. Anybody seen a picture of, the, of Israel? Yeah, I say yes, it's a picture. The Temple Mount is where the first temple was set. Where King Solomon built the temple for the Jewish uh, 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 tabernacle that now became a big temple. The first time a structure was built for God. You remember when he finished and he was praying, his eyes opened. He said, who can build a house for God? This God does not live in a house built by man, right? Remember how that story. So, but the Jews take the temple very seriously. They don't play with it. But guess what? There's something sitting on that temple mount today. You know what it is? A mosque. Yep. A mosque. A great mosque sits on that temple mount. The only thing Jews can come near to that temple mount is the wall. If you notice sometimes when you see a picture of Jewish people, they're standing by a wall. Above that wall, the big foundation is the wall. It's part of the wall. On top of where the, the actual King Solomon's temple was built, it's a big mosque sitting on top of it. Today. And this happened when the Muslims, through Persian media, the Muslims, when they ran through the whole of Asia and Europe, they actually ruled all the way to Spain. People don't realize that. And when they ran through, remember when they ran through North Africa, West Africa? That's how you get all the youth Muslims in Africa. Because they were ruling. They were doing their jihad as they were coming. So they built this temple. The other temple was destroyed. They destroyed and they built this, uh, this mosque. And the mosque sits on that place. They, they rule for far more than 500 years. People don't realize this. So when the Bible talks about the patient, the media will be will reign. It's not only about one day thing, generations. Then he says, Greece will rise and attack. If you put this in history, you can see it as when the West rose and came against them, they pushed them out. They pushed all these people out and Greece, I mean media and Persia are no longer what they used to be. Persia is like Iran now, you know, Iraq, all those places, Afghanistan and Pakistan, all those they stand. They are no longer as strong as they were. Why? Because Greece is now the powerhouse. Remember what Greece is? All European type, Europe, even Russia, Caucasian type, you know, that's in Greece. Say they will take over. He came, say he flew, without touching the ground and attacked the run. Some people will say, oh, maybe that was it. America flying over the ocean. I'm not saying that, praise <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and you know in part, you only speak in part. Then the one that should scare us or make us make our mind kind of, you know, wake up and look at the Bible and say, what is this Bible? It's amazing that in your generation, the Bible can become current and real to you. Maybe some people in the past generation read the same thing and felt it was their time. Maybe people in the future will read this same thing and say, you know, this is actually their own time. I don't know. What I know is that this is amazing reading. And the Holy Spirit, this is when we look for the Holy Spirit to help us open the scriptures. Because what I'm about to read now uh, talks for itself. I want you to turn your Bible to Mataniel 8, 23 to 25. If you have your Bible, you're going to read them verse by verse or point by point. 23 to 25. Daniel 8, 23 to 25. If you agree that we are in the time of Greece, and you know what I said about Greece, now let us look at this. 23 says, and the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness. Talking about the Greek king, how he will arise. A king shall arise having fierce features. The king of the Greek kingdom, right? Having fierce features. Who understands sinister schemes? In other words, he's going to be a schemer. He understands how to scheme. You know what scheming is? Praise the Lord. Pay attention so you don't ask me questions later. He has to scheme. You don't know how to scheme. He says, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Are you paying attention? People are going to say, how is he able to get away with stuff? How can he do this? How can he do that? And people watching, isn't the world what? How can this? The Bible says that he will do mighty things, but not of his own power. In other words, there's going to be a power behind him. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. That is the Bible. I'm not, I, I don't even add my own word. I'm reading directly, praise the Lord. Because I, when I read it, I said my interpretation, I better read really it the way it is written. It says, He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. In other words, in that when, when he begins, he begins to do stuff, people say, oh man, oh, he's destroying everything. You look at him and say, he looks like the more he does, the more he's getting famous or notorious, whichever way you want to make it. Then he says, he shall destroy, he shall do what? Destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Mm -hmm. Are you paying attention? He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. So, holy people are who? God's people, praise the Lord. So, part of the uh, mark of his power is that he, his destructive power eventually affects holy people. And being a little cryptic, I want you to let God speak to you. Praise the Lord. The next point, verse 25. Through his calling, he shall cause the seed to prosper under his rule. Through his calling, he shall cause the seed to prosper. In other words, uh, what is the word now? Ethics and honesty, sincerity and honor will mean nothing anymore. The integrity will be just a word for the fool. Because what will prosper, what will be reigning, is what deceit. Through his calling, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. 
people will be proud to stand for what they stand for, even if it's bad. They will be proud to stand for it. And people will be blinded. Everybody will be looking at things from their own point of view, no longer from God's point of view. What is in it for me? That is all I want to pay attention to. I don't care what else happens, you know, besides that. We continue. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall exalt himself in his heart. What does that mean? He shall feel that he is the best person, the most powerful person. If you don't agree with that, something is wrong with you. If you don't trust him, if you don't like him, you are in trouble. Because in his mind, he knows better than you, he knows better than everybody. <laughs> it says, he shall destroy many in their prosperity. Now that was a tricky one. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. My, my understanding of that is that during his time, many shall prosper. Praise the Lord. Many shall prosper in the beginning. It will look like everybody is gaining something. Oh, we are loving him. We are going to prop him up even more and more. Then towards the end, we're going to find out that everybody is going to pay. Everybody will pay. If time permission would have gone to where the Bible talks about the abomination of desolation, how when he came, everybody is healing him, even the Jews are healing him. And when they started killing pig on their altar, they screamed, oh my God, what is this abomination? It was too late. It wasn't gone true. That was also prophetic. So a lot of people who will follow this Greek king, Again, Greek means Western king, or emperor, whatever you want to call him. At the end, they're going to turn around and realize that they are sold, they are sold to the devil. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. Who do we know as the prince of princes? Jesus Christ. There will be a time when he will stand up boldly and say, Jesus, you hold nothing against me. I stand above you. I am in charge. Now the people who think that, oh, he was for Jesus, because say, what is he doing? What is he talking about? It will be too late because now nobody can say anything. He has now taken control of the world. If you open your mouth, then the head will roll. He shall rise against the prince of princes. But the Bible says, but he shall be broken without human means. Amen. Amen. He shall be broken. So at the end, the Lord will destroy this Persian or this uh, Greek king, prophetically given to us here. But not before he has done so many evil on earth that men could not stop him. But the Lord will stop him. Amen? Amen. The Lord will stop him. But why are we told all this? So that you and I will not fall victim. In this whole process, we need to keep our eye on the Lord and what is right. We need to stand for Christ always and realize that, look, no matter what is going on, at the end game is that Jesus Christ will prevail. And when he prevails, those people who belong to him are people who prevail with him. That is why the scripture is trying to teach us. Anytime it's not a thing to be taken, uh, not to be taken seriously, this sinister and scheming uh, Greek king will be on the earth will do his thing. Some people say, oh, he's already on the earth. He's doing, beginning to do his thing. It's your judge. Your, yours to judge. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Many shall fall under his charm. Let us rise as we round up. The Bible tells us that many shall fall under his charm. Some people shall praise him at the beginning of his reign. At the end, everyone shall lament. 
Christians and non-Christians alike, but I'm saying shall eventually be affected by him. But the Lord will prevail over him. Amen? Amen. I say the Lord will prevail over him. Amen. Even at this time, I want us to, to just begin to thank the Lord that he is revealing these things to us, his people. This is another reason why you and I should not lose heart, even when we are dealing with things in our day-to-day -day life. We know that the Lord is in control of all things. He sees everything. People say, why is the Lord allowing things to happen? It's not your place or my place to ask those kind of questions. It's our place to know that no matter what is happening, the Lord is still in control. He will not allow you and I to overcome, go through things that will overwhelm us if we stay, if we stay focused on what we should be doing. If we continue to trust in the Lord, I want to strike that. We need to thank the Lord for a relationship that you have with Him. We need to thank Him that you are not afraid of the end time. You are not discarding the end time either. Thank Him that you are part of His kingdom. The Bible says, What will it profit a man that he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Thank him that you are not about to lose your soul. Just begin to thank the Lord now. This is the time I want us just to spend just a second, just a couple of minutes. I want you to relax onto the Lord. In fact, right now, if you can, if you want to get on your knees before the Lord, I want you to just kneel before the Lord right now. And just take a moment a moment to allow the Spirit of the Lord to minister to your heart. Tell him, say, Lord, I thank you for who you are to me. I thank you for what you've been doing in my life. I thank you, my Lord and my God. I trust you and your word always. I know no matter what is happening around me, that you are with me. I thank you for my family right now, Lord. Thank you that we are not outside looking in, but we are part of the kingdom. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Said the Holy Spirit is our helper. He has come to show us how to be true Christians. He has come to open heaven to us. I want you to speak to the Spirit of God yourself right now. Have you ever talked to the Holy Spirit? What would you say to the Holy Spirit now? Will you ask Him to show you things that you don't know? Will you ask Him to give you a glimpse of heaven as our eyes are closed? Can we see the heaven, heavenly throne of the Lord? You let your hearts begin to see the heavenly throne of God. We can see it through the book of Revelation. The Bible says that before the throne are some elders. Do you see the elders right now? The Bible says that there are as if it's like a sea of glass, 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 multitudes, multitudes of beings before the throne. 
can you can you allow yourself to see that that sin where there are multitudes as far as the eye can go and they are glistering shimmering like glass the Bible said there is an end rainbow coming from the throne it's like a constant rainbow spreading from the throne outwards over that sea of glass you allow the spirit to tell you what that signifies that the blessings of the Lord flowing over his people non-stop blessing and covering the Bible says that they, were, they are all focused on the truth they are all focused on the truth there is no distraction nothing is distracting them and all they were saying is led by the elders holy 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 are you lord god almighty that was what they were chanting or they are chanting Can you see yourself amongst the people before the throne and chanting, Holy, Holy? Bible says as they chant, the elders fall on their face because the glory of God is so awesome. No matter how much we desire to look on His face, the glory is so much that we can't even behold the awesome face of the Lord. enough for us to be in his holy presence. I want you to feel the presence of God around us right now. Feel the gentle spiritual breeze of the Lord that's blowing around you. Allow his gentle presence surround you to surround you to feel you breathe him in breathe him in let him 